code emotion. Good morning. All right, very good. Thank you. Thank you for showing up here. Uh, my name is Arun Gupta, and I work for Oracle. Uh, technology evangelist, Java evangelist. My real title is Java E and Glassfish guy, actually. Um, that's all my history um, at Sun, now Oracle. I came through Sun acquisition. Um, so been with Oracle for close to 13 years now, actually. Um, and I have a, a blog. So I'm going to post the slides on my blog, so you can access all the slides over there. Blogs.oracle.com slash Arun Gupta, one word. Okay? And like, just like everybody and anybody, I have a Twitter handle as well. So um, this is just a marketing slide, legal slide, saying you know, it's, it's a safe harbor statement. Um, all the dates that I give here are indicative only. Okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about you know, Jax RS 2.0. But before we talk about JAX RS 2.0, what it is, I will kind of give you a brief history of how we actually got here. Okay? So in terms of how we got here, you know, I'll give you a short intro to JAX RS 1.0. Then I will talk about the requested features for JAX RS 2.0. And then I will actually get into the details of JAX RS 2.0. How many of you are actually familiar with JAX RS today? OK, some of you. So I think the introduction would be really helpful in that case. So JAX RS stands for Java API for RESTful Web Services. Um, XML, you know, JAX is more like, you know, it says X in there, but X is mostly superficial. Because when you're doing RESTful Web Services, you're not just confined to XML as such. You know, you could, whatever format you're using, it's OK. Could be text, could be JSON, could be HTML, could be a binary format as well. Uh, but JAX RS, the idea is Java API for RESTful web services. It's a server-side API primarily. So you, know, you work with, you know, at least in 1.0 time frame, you have a POJO object. On a POJO, you put an annotation. And you say, I want to expose this POJO or publish this POJO at a RESTful web service. So the annotation would say what path you want to publish this at. So it will start pu publishing that at that particular path. Then you say, OK, this RESTful web service is now exposed at this path, but I want to invoke a method when I call an HTTP verb on this service. So by the REST principle, you know, everything is assigned an ID. Your path is the ID, for example. Uh, common set of methods, you know, HTTP defines get, put, post, and delete. So you're saying that, OK, I want to invoke my resource a particular HTTP verb. I want to create a resource, so I'm going to say post. I want to get a resource, I'm going to call HTTP get. I want to delete a resource, I will say HTTP delete. So the idea is you can call any of those verbs on a resource. So there are corresponding annotations in the JAX RS line on how you can create that. Okay? And everything is actually stateless communication. So you don't store any state on the server side. And Another key aspect of RESTful, the RESTful principle is, the RESTful principle is that each resource could have multiple representations. So, for example, you say, "Give me this resource using HTTP GET." Um, that resource could be represented in text, JSON, XML, HTML, or any format. And we'll talk about how the server-side negotiation and the client-side negotiation works in that. So quick summary, you know, it's a POJO-based API focused exclusively on HTTP today. It's format independent. So you, you, don't, you of course, define what representations are going to be given out, but you don't change your programming model based upon the format. It's container independent as well. So you can write your JAX RS application, deploy in any container, um, and it is already included in the Java EE platform. So if we take a look at the service, this is my sample service. Um, just take a look at the black text to begin with. Now the black text indicates um, that's my POJO service. It's an ATM service. It's got a balance method, you know, returning type string. It's got two parameters, card and pin. Not the right way to pass your card and pin as part of the parameters, uh, but just to convey the point. And it's returning you know, what the balance is. You know, get balance is probably your business method, which is going into the database and doing the business logic. Okay? Now, I want to invoke, I want to publish this POJO, the black code, you know, as a RESTful web service. What do I do? I put my annotation at the very top, say add path. 
um, that means this ATM service is available at slash ATM slash in curly braces I am saying card ID. So, what that means is the card ID over there in the path would get mapped it, first of all this is the fixed part of the URL no this does not change card ID is the variable part of the URL this card ID actually gets mapped to at path param card ID. So, if you invoke this restful resource as slash ATM slash 11223344 when you actually invoke this service or access this service using HTTP get that number automatically gets passed over here. This one is a query param what that means is um, if you are submitting you know a query parameter which is like a question mark name value pair. So, that would be passed here automatically well and what we are saying here is when we are returning the response it is a string we are just returning text slash plain this is saying that this is my um, this method is going to be invoked when HTTP get is invoked and here I am saying path. So, idea is slash ATM slash whatever card ID is again fixed path slash balance this is exactly when this method would be invoked. So, this is how you would read this method effectively. Now, I showed you, you know how uh, th those are my two resources. So, add path and add path the first one is the top level resource then this is a sub resource. I have built in serialization. So, when I say add produces I am saying text slash plain string is a Java native type. So, it just works as is you just return it and it automatically takes care of it. Then I have a URI parameter injection path param query param that works as well and that is my HTTP get method bindings I am saying at get and that is when the, this method is being invoked. Now, if I have to show you an example of a customer serialization. So, I am not returning say string I want to return say as part of balance I want to return my POJO object say money and again this is purely a POJO object right here this is purely a POJO object here I am saying produces application slash JSON. Now, it is a POJO money is a POJO how does it get converted to JSON in that case. So, possibly I have a XML root element annotation over there which is a JAXB annotation. Now, JAXB says how to convert Java to XML and vice versa, but the Jackson mapper allows you to take that XML convert it into JSON as well or take Java and convert it into JSON and that is how this conversion really works. So, let us take a look you know that was sort of a quick probably the shortest introduction to JAX RS 1.0 hopefully you are good and you know, I start writing program in it now. Uh, now, if I tell you about the set of features that are coming in JAX RS 2.0 or at least the features that were requested. Um, now, everything I showed you on the server side um, using POJO base annotation driven you could do all of that using servlets as well, but a whole lot more code you need to write to get that accomplished. Same thing on the client side you know if you want to invoke a restful resource you can do that using Java .NET APIs, but you will have to create a URL connection handle the errors back and then you will have to play around in the sense what about the HTTP error codes what about the handcrafting of the message it's a post it's a put it's a delete. So, the code becomes really ugly really soon. So, one of the features that was requested was a easy to use client API. So, that is the one on the top left. Now, we also need some capability to do pre processing of requests and post processing of response logging g zipping things like that. So, that is where your filters and handlers kick in it is a restful world. So, everything is resources and resources are linked with each other. So, that allows you to say hypermedia support um, bean validation is a new specification in the uh, Java EE platform. So, we are saying how can we use that. So, think about an HTML form and that form is submitted to a you know restful endpoint. What if the form parameters are invalid do you do client side validation or do you let Jax RS do the validation for you. So, that is what we are going to talk about here uh, it is a restful resource you know uh, on the server side on the client side as well. What if your server side is taking too long is taking to the database or loading a file in the memory. So, your server side resources are expensive. So, what do we do how do we handle it that is where your async comes in 
we talked about connection negotiation as well a little bit. Now we'll talk more about that, how client side and contents, server side content negotiation is going to work on it. Okay? So that's the sort of feature set that was requested. With that, the expert group itself was formed in March of 2011, so about a year now. Uh, Oracle is leading the specification, um, and the early draft was actually published last month. So the specifications are available. You can take a look at it yourself. Now let's take a look at where we are going. You know, so I'll click on each of those features, see which features are approved, and which features are we going to take a look at. Well, actually, one feature that we forgot to talk about here is MVC. So now you can also think of your JAX RS endpoint as a sort of the main controller because your HTML form is being submitted. That's the controller, and that could actually talk to a model, which is possibly your JPA entity. So there were discussions around, oh, do we need an MVC architecture in JAX RS where we could plug in different templating languages and different models at the back end with JAX RS being the controller? So those were the set of features requested. Now, of all those features, MVC was the only one pretty much that was rejected, primarily because you know, it was considered out of scope. Or it would have caused duplicate work, because JSF already provides you a standard MVC architecture. So today, I'm going to talk about each of these features, show you some sample code, and we'll take a look at that. So let's start with client API. So as I said, you know, our HTTP client libraries that exist in JDK today are very low level. You will have to write you know, java.net API, HTTP URL connection, handle the error codes back, you know, make sure there is appropriate spacing between you know, the characters, there is a white line to end the message or dot to end the message. You will have to build you know, a whole lot of custom code over there. Now, JAXRS already has some of that functionality available. You know, it already has JAXRS server API, which defines several of those concepts. It also defines something called as message beam readers and writers, or MBRs and MBWs, which allows you to automatically provide custom serialization. So instead of you writing all of that custom code, the idea was to provide a custom client API, or a client API, which can be easily be used. And as a matter of fact, Several JAX RS implementations already have a client API, just not standard. So let's take a look at how my client API is going to look like. Um, now this is going to be a standard code, and everything is you know, a work in progress. But a quick look is, you'll say from the client factory, you could say I want to create a new client. Get a new client. You can also inject URI for the target. So you don't need to say you know, client factory dot new client. With CDI or context and dependency injection, you should be able to say at inject client and give it the URI. This should automatically have the client ready for you for that web resource. That's sort of the idea. But anyway, once you get the client, here I'm setting target. But if you're specifying URI, you don't need to set the target here. So on the client, you say, what is my target? That is my URI, which I'm going to invoke. Then you specify the path param. We were talking about how I'm going to specify my card ID here. You give the card ID. This is my query param. Then I'm going to say request. I want a text slash plain. And I'm going to invoke HTTP get method here, return type being string. So that's a typical builder pattern that we have in the client API, how you can invoke a RESTful resource. Talk a little bit more about it. Everything else stays as is. Here, what I'm doing is um, I have my client target, path param, query param, request. Now I'm requesting application slash JSON. I'm making a post request this time, and this is my post body. I'm saying text and a money dot class. The return type is money, basically. And then that's how I'm seeing the response back as money. So I'm withdrawing some money, basically. That's a standard design pattern you know, where we actually say static invocation. You can also do dynamic invocation. Let's say you want to invoke a bunch of RESTful web services. So you can create your invocation, what we call as invocation API. Um, you can create your invocations, and these are generic. You say client target, request, build get. So this will build a get request for you. Um, 
then you could say client target, request application JSON, build post. So you're building a post request for you. So let's say you want to invoke a series of gets and posts and puts and deletes. You can build a generic invocation targets over there and fire them in an array. This is just a typical way you would do them. You know, you'll create a collection of invocation, you know, arrays as list, and then you can do the transformation on the collections, which is returning a response back to you. It's not using a standard JDK API, but there are lots of utilities that allow you to take an object, run it, run over the collection of it, and return a response back. That's what it's using. All right, that was our client API. Let's take a look at interceptors and handlers now. Now, these are standard extension points you know, for request pre-processing and response post-processing. So the idea is, let's say your request is going out and you want to log the request. Um, or your request is going out, you want to gzip the request. You don't want to put that as part of your implementation. Because today you may have the need for gzip, tomorrow you may not have the need for gzip. So you want to put it as an extension point. So that's where the uh, filters and uh, uh, interceptors come in. As I said, logging, compression, security, etc. over there. They're shared by client and server APIs, and I'll show you a programming model for that. And another use case over there, motivation over there was, these were already supported by pre all the implementations, but non-standard. This is a standard way of doing it. So what's the difference between filter and handlers, or, or interceptors? Well, handlers was in the earlier version of the specification, now it's called as interceptors. Now filters are non-wrapping extension point. Now I think the key part over there is, um, the, the way I wrap my hand around it, my head around it is, filters do not change the request in any way. Handlers or interceptors could change the request itself. So filters is a good data point for logging the request, for example. Interceptors, on the other hand, uh, gzipping or security would be a good use case because there you're actually changing the request object itself. So when you get the response back, then you want to un-gzip or uncompress or un-securityfy it, you know, th things like that. So that's a typical use case of how I put my head around it. But in both of them, there is a filter chain and there's an interceptor chain. At any point of time, you can break the loop saying, okay, you know, I have logged the request, but something didn't go right, I'm going to break out of it. Or I'm trying to verify the security credentials, they were not met, so I'm going to break the response and say, you know what, don't do any further processing. Here is an example of a logging filter. So you will just say class logging filter, you will put the add provider annotation saying this is a filter provider. You will say request filter, response filter, and there are methods over here. Uh, call as pre-filter and I think post-filter, which I'm going to show in the next slide. But when you say pre-filter, this is the request pre-processing. You get a filter context and, a, and then you can do something with the context. In this case, you're just logging it, so you context or get request and get done with it. When you say filter action dot next, that means invoke the next filter in the chain. That's the logic. Same thing with post filter, you get a filter context, you log the response and you say filter action dot next. Very simple, okay? As I said about interceptors, these are wrapping extension points and the big difference over there is um, you can actually modify the request over here. Again, same thing, there is a part of a interceptor chain, you could, you know, you do not call the, ne you call the next handler directly in this case. So let's take a look. So I have my gzip interceptor here, implementing read interceptor and writer interceptor. Um, and there are methods over here, around read from and around write from. So they run around my business methods. Uh, again, same thing, there is a context here. And within the, con based upon the context, if you know it is already gzip encoded, you can ignore it. If it's not gzip encoded, then you can actually encode it. And here you're using standard you know, JDK APIs for gzipping. And the same thing you would do if you have to do around write from. So gzipping on one side, and gzipping on the other side. Now with a lot of filters and hand, uh, interceptors, handlers all over, um, it's important to understand their sequence uh, execution of sequ uh, sequence ex execution. So on the, the easiest way to remember that is in the order of the request. 
So, let us say this is my client at the far end is my server. So, the request goes here, this is sort of the internet, this is goes here, comes back here, this is my server endpoint where my business logic gets executed, comes back here over the internet, back on the client and then it goes over here. So, in the order of execution, filter gets executed first and then comes my handler slash interceptor. So that is sort of the important thing to understand. So, when you start programming in those languages or in those terminology, it would be a important thing for you to remember. Now, I define my logging filter, how do I attach that logging filter to my restful resource? Well, you define a name binding saying this is going to be my um, logged filter for example, the filter is implemented somewhere else and then on the logging, well, this, is the, this is where the filter is implemented. So, on the logging filter which is implementing your request filter and response filter, we put the provider annotation just like last time and you are saying this is my logged filter. So, once you give it a name that this is my binding, on your POJO which is doing your get produces path all of that stuff, you say I want to log this method. So, only this method gets executed which is or only this method is attached to the filter or actually other way around. The filter is attached to this method. So, you can do that very easily. All right, let us take a look at um, JSR 330 and validation, how bean validation is going to be incorporated in the platform itself. The important motivation over there is services must validate data. You know, you are invoking a restful web service, you know, if a string is passed, if a string is required and an integer is passed, what should happen, what should be the right behavior or vice versa, you know, how, how things should really work. The key part is Java E platform already provides bean validation which is the standard way of doing validation. You literally take a POJO, put an annotation on the POJO and the underlying bean validator would actually do the validation for you. So, the idea is to provide an integration of bean validation into the JAXRS itself. Um, different ways by which we can do constraint annotations um, could be fields and properties you know like of my POJO. Uh, could be by parameters, method parameters which are getting mapped from path param and query param, all of those, my method itself or resource classes themselves and I will show you samples for each one of these. So, let us take a look. Now, this is my, my resource class, this should be a public risk class my resource class, exposed at the root context. Um, here is a register user method that is invoked when HTTP post is being called. HTTP post is being called and this is consuming uh, application form URL encoded. That is how you submit an HTML form using post to a JAXRS resource. So, this is the consumes type. So, produces is what it produces, consumes it what MIME type it consumes. When you are submitting a HTML form, this is a standard MIME type. In register user, then you say there are three parameters, uh, first name, last name and email. The form is being submitted, you could start attaching parameters here saying add form param that imagine in your HTML form you had three fields, first name, last name and email, name exactly like this. So, then those are directly associated with my method parameters here uh, by add form param annotation, which is good, which is a standard JAXRS. The new part here is where you are actually adding these annotations. So, the idea is you want to say that I do not want my first name and last name to be null. So, instead of checking it into your HTML form, all you are saying is at not null, at not null. When the request is submitted, this is a standard bean validation annotation. When the request is submitted, it will make sure the validation happens at the right place. Now, those are built in. You can also have a custom annotation here. This is a custom bean validator or custom uh, validation implementation you are saying at email. Now, in the implementation of the at email which looks something like this, you could have you know I mean it is basically defined in a class. So, you have a class called as email validator which implements a standard class saying email of the type string which is defined over here public add interface is a meta annotation which is what you put on your um, uh, JAXRS resource. Then I have an initialize method, then I have a is valid. Now, in is valid 
which is the implementation of your validation algorithm, you could actually go talk to the database and do whatever logic you want to do. Make sure it's a registered user or it's the right format. Um, you know, ignore domains like example.com and so on and so forth. Here's another example. So right at the class user, you could define add check user one. And in add check user one, maybe you have already put uh, how POJO is going to be validated. So you're defining exactly what my check user one is going to do. In this, uh, that was at the class level. Now in my resource class, let's say you have nothing else. In a method, you could say add valid. So you, you, by just putting add valid user, is automatically going to invoke that invocation or, or the annotation. Here you could also say, you know, um, let's say register user one two. You are saying at valid, so it's going to invoke check user one, but here is going to also do an additional check, which is check user two. So depending upon what your requirement is, all those combinations are very possible. And all I'm showing you is just you know a literally a, a quick a scratch of the surface. You know, there's a lot more details that are available under this. <laughs> Let's take a look at uh, async and what's the motivation over there. As I talked about it, the motivation over there is really, you know, let the borrowed threads run free. You know, I mean, the typical way the whole thing works is, you know, you have a server side, a client request comes in, you know, you, tr you have a worker thread and an actual you know, a receiver thread. And the receiver thread receives it and then it hands it over to the actual worker thread which does the real work. And th that's exactly the programming model that we are trying to achieve here. And now uh, even on the worker thread, let's say you are doing lots of database access or let's say you are running a long standing query or let's say um, you are doing some file load. So things like that could take a longer time. So since worker thread is coming from a pool, it's a borrowed thread. You don't want it to you know, be running for a longer time. So the idea is to give it a little bit more, um, um, little bit more time that, hey, you know what? Go do something else. I will let you know when I'm done, and then I'm going to correlate the response back to the client. So the way this works is suspend and resume. That's a typical design pattern. So when you receive a request, you know it's going to be a long-standing request. It's going to take a longer time to process it. So you suspend it so that the worker thread goes back. And then once you are done, then you resume it, and then the response is correlated back to the client. Now, that's on the server side. So on the client side, the, server, the client does not receive a response until the response is correlated. But client is completely, you know, um, uh, does not know at all that, oh, there is an asynchrony happening on the server side. On the other hand, you know, if you, are, if you don't care about what server side is doing, on the client side as well, you can have complete asynchrony. And um, I'll talk about that. Well, there are two ways by which you do that, and I'll show code samples for that. So let's say I have a resource at this path, say async slash async slash long running. Okay? Um, here I could um, inject a pr execution context. Um, it's a private variable. I'm saying uh, inject a context that's coming into me into execution context. It provides you a little bit more um, uh, environment features around you know, wh what's available to you. In this resource, I have <coughs> excuse me. In this resource, I have a method called as long running op, which is invoked for HTTP GET and produces text slash plain. Now, let's say I know that this method is for sure long running, so you could easily uh, spin up a single thread executor, submit it, run it in a separate thread. So what would happen is, is if effectively, as soon as you come into this method, long running op, it spins this up in a separate thread, and it goes to context.suspend, effectively. So the thread is suspended right away, because this is running in its own thread. Okay? When the long running operation <coughs> consumes, so here I'm, I'm coming into my thread, which is saying public void run. I'm sleeping for just 10 seconds. After 10 seconds, it says context.resume, which is my execution context injected here. It prints a method, and then the response is sent back to the client. So this is effectively what is being sent back to the client in the text slash plane. 
Now, a simpler way of doing this is, you know, exact same code is where you can put the add suspend annotation. You don't need to say context.suspend. Just, you know, two different ways of doing the same thing. Now, on the client side, there is an API um, support for async as well. And the way that works is, you know, you create your, and this is again using the client API that we talked about earlier. So we say client.target on the target request. You know, we say async. Before get, we say async. And then as part of that, we provided an invocation callback. So we have a callback method on the client side, which would be invoked whether, when the request is either completed or failed. And then here you can put your business logic. What happens when the complete is done or what happens when a fail happens? And this is where you return the response value as such. Now, remember here, the return type is not string because we are not really getting the response right here. The response is actually received here as this parameter. Here what we are getting is a future object. Future is a standard JDK 1.6 concurrency API. So on that future you could say, oh is the request done, not done, or if it's too long then you can even cancel the request. So you can do all that processing right here itself. Let's talk about uh, hypermedia. Now, this is a, this is a tough one. HatOS, <laughs> hypermedia is the engine of app state. It basically states that everything that you want to do as part of RESTful web service can be, okay, the whole conversation can happen within the message itself. So for example, I could say, I um, get me a resource about the account information. In the account information, you get the account ID. Then you extract the account ID from there, and then you say, I want to withdraw. So then you make another request by extracting the account ID, and then you make HTTP get, say, withdraw. And then you say, once you withdraw, you get a response back. Using the same account ID, you can say, get me the balance. So it's not, you're not storing a state anywhere. The, each message is giving you enough information to derive a meaning out of it and invoke the next message. That's sort of the logic here. Now there are two types of links, structural links and transitional links. Um, transitional links only says that, okay, um, you can change a state of a RESTful resource. Structural links, you know, they allow you for doing lazy initialization. Now in JAXRS, we will support only transitional links for now because structural links is a little bit more time consuming and um, would be a little bit out of the scope as well. But let's see how we're gonna support uh, transitional links. So, um, in, well, first of all, the difference between structural and transitional link. So, the transitional links are typically in a header. The structural links are in the body itself. So, for example, here you could say um, whatever your U service URL is, order slash one slash slip ship, and you say rel equals ship. So, this becomes your transitional link. And here in this case, uh, let's say you're receiving the entire response from the client or from the server. Um, when you receive the address of a customer and you want to get more details about it, that is actually your structural link. The reason this is a little bit more time consuming is because it would require a rev to the JAX-RS programming model, not only that, but JAX-B programming model and things like that. So in terms of using transitional link, it should be pretty straightforward. You know, once you receive a response, um, uh, or actually when you're preparing the response, you're saying, response dot okay, you know, you actually put the order for which you're building the response, and then you're putting the transitional link right there. This will actually put the right attributes that are going to go as part of your HTTP headers. On the client side, you could say, you know, I'm building a target, requesting, and getting a, uh, getting a response back, and then you could say, if order dot get link ship, these two are correlated, um, if it's not null, then I'm going to do the next invocation. Let's take a look at improved connection negotiation. Well, today, um, as I said, JAX-RS is primarily a server-side API. So on a method of a resource, you could put, you know, add produces clause, which could say I produce application JSON, application XML, text plane, etc. So how does the content negotiation work? So today the client has to send an accept header, which would say, oh, this is exactly 
what I'm accepting. So it doesn't matter what the MIME types you support, but this is the one that I can handle. Could vary upon the browser, vary upon the client, vary upon the device, so on and so forth. So it's all client side driven. What if a server wants, to, if a client does not say what is the preferred MIME type and server is listing multiple MIME types that can be spit out. Is there a preferred MIME type? It's totally independent to each implementation today. So this is an example of a client negotiation. So client would send a message called as text slash star that I want only text uh, uh, representations and here text slash plain text slash HTML. So what does the server do in this case? Because there is no preferred MIME type in, uh, that is on the server side. So what we are saying is we will start defining, we have, we have, we have defined an attribute called as QS. It is a standard attribute by the way, it is nothing new that we are defining. We are going to use it as part of our uh, produces class. So you can assign priorities. So client here says text slash star with a priority Q equals 1 as a standard HTTP attribute. Now here you come to server side, it says text plain, text HTML, HTML is a higher priority. So if client makes a request, doesn't care about which text representation, server will return the HTML representation. That makes it very easy. There are some other topics that are under consideration. Uh, for example, a better integration with JSR 330, how we can have a better injection all across JAX-RS layer. Uh, a higher level client API is also being discussed. People think that the, high, the client API that we have is not high enough. Um, so think about you know, how in Corba or in web services, SOAP based web services, you could create a client stub um, and then all the state is stored over there and then you can make an invocation. That's sort of the discussion that is happening in the JAX RS expert group as well. How, how could I take a look at the web service description and generate a client stub which would then do all the invocation for me? All right, so all the details about the JSR, the early draft are available at the JSR page. Um, you can download the spec right here itself. There's a user's alias as well. Uh, there are binary implementations that are available today. They're not integrated into Glassfish yet, but you can still run the samples. And I just found out about it literally two days back. So I'm going to try some samples you know, in the next few days and blog about them. So in case you want to try out JAX-RS, 2.0 samples, they should be out on my blog soon. Code emotion.